So I mentioned the first question it can be a complex question, and we had to really give it a, a surface treatment in terms of uh, answering it. What we're going to delve into now with the second question uh, speaks to the idea of accelerating the startup of the team. So once you have, as they say, the right people in the right roles um, and you're forming new teams, how do you actually go and help that team accelerate its startup? You may be familiar uh, with different models of team effectiveness. We're going to go over three in particular that are quite common. And then the fourth one we're going to talk about is actually the one that I, I find a lot of value in. Uh, I'm actually taking a break today from uh, doing some work with a leadership team in, in terms of that fourth model. One of the more common ones is called the GRIPI model, Goals, Roles, Process, Interpersonal. Uh, the premise is to be aligned as a team, you really need to focus on having common goals or, or at least interdependent goals. And then from that, what roles do you need to establish? What team processes do you need to have? And how do you work through any potential interpersonal um, issues so that you have effective communication ability to work through conflict? So it's shaped as a pyramid because most of what's going to influence how well a team does or doesn't do uh, focuses on how well they're aligned around a common or interdependent goal. If uh, you go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble and looking up books in terms of team effectiveness, uh, chances are this particular book, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, will show up. Uh, so similar to the Grippy model, yes, it's shaped like a pyramid, uh, but it focuses on different things. And this model starts with the premise that if you don't have trust, you can't have a high-performing team. And absence of trust uh, presents a fear of conflict in organizations. And without that, they'll have no commitment or be able to hold one another accountable to get to the desired results. So if you were to look at that pyramid in the positive sense, it would go as follows. If you have trust, you can work through conflict. If you can work through conflict, you'll have commitment. If you can have commitment, you can then be accountable. And the accountability then is what leads to the results. Both good models so far. They're practical, and I find that organizational leaders do enjoy working with them. And then finally, another model that you may or may not have seen before uh, talks about um, the four stages that teams need to go through. So the graph basically is the performance of the team and the effectiveness of the team as it goes through those stages. Uh, so there's sort of this honeymoon period where teams come together, they form, they see a little dip in terms of their effectiveness uh, due to the storming. And um, what that normally means is that they're working through those issues that we talked about with the previous models. They come through with more of a, a norming effect or a common understanding of how to work together. And then they improve upon that norming phase to reach a higher level of team performance. Probably could have 20 more slides with 20 more models, um, but I think you get the point that uh, they can be very simple yet elegant in terms of how you can use that information to work with teams. The model that I have relied on um, quite a bit lately, though, is, is a different model, and it's called the team task cycle. And in this model, basically, uh, it's the recognition, understanding, decision, implementation, and completion steps that all teams have to go through together in order to be effective and to uh, lead organizations. And what I find is the challenge is getting all team members to have that journey together as a collective team. So what takes place? Well, during recognition, something appears on the radar screen for your leadership team. Um, it's some identification of the circumstances, what purpose or task is in front of them, and then are there any biases or constraints or assumptions. A perfect example would be in healthcare, where the Affordable Care Act all of a sudden appears on the radar screens of your CEOs of hospitals and your COOs of hospitals, and then they have to figure out what do we do with this information. From recognition goes understanding. And basically here what you're doing is you're confirming what the issues are. Is it a real issue? Um, often you, you find that there's a need to clarify and amplify a situation uh, to make it a little bit more understandable. And often data in terms of analysis is used to inform um, future steps. 
at some point, if the team is going to work, it has to make a decision. And so you have to come up with the idea of selecting the best option, uh, determining what will success look like once that decision has been made. And what I find to be the, the biggest tripping point for teams is they confuse consensus with commitment. Uh, so at this point, you may have different views or different points of view about an issue. Um, what I find to be the healthy way then is to make sure that everyone has a voice in the process and everyone feels that their voice has been heard, but at some point, everyone on the team has to demonstrate a commitment to move forward. Uh, you can't leave any stragglers behind at this point. And then finally, the decision gets made, so now you have to then be able to take all those ideas and good thinking and put it into action. So that's where project plans come into place. Um, this notion of readjusting, plan, do, check, act is very helpful. And then finally here, in terms of the task cycle, the last part would be completion, where you may have follow-up activity. You're looking at ways of sustaining the implementation. Uh, it's important that senior leaders take the reins, uh, uh, hands off the reins, and let those that work uh, for the organization to be empowered. And so in a sense, there's a release of authority to others to make that happen. What we find then is if the team is successful in doing that, it brings them right back to square one, which is recognition, because now something else comes on the radar screen. There's a, a new strategic direction. Uh, there's a new initiative that needs to be addressed, a new problem to be solved. And so the task of the leadership team then is to have this awareness about this and then complete the cycle again and again and again. So let's see what this would look like in sort of a hypothetical situation. So here's a, our leadership team. You can count the number of members on the team, and we don't really know what the roles are, but it's not so important for what we're going to talk about. The first notion is, are they operating under a common goal? And I would argue that with most teams, uh, they get put together, and they may be a team in name only, but they're not a team in the sense that they have a common purpose and a, a common or a set of interdependent goals. So what happens in the minds of the, of the team players is that everyone comes to this with certain needs, certain agendas, and certain ways of looking at the world. So good team leaders will take the time to understand each of the team members, will take the time to figure out, to drive the strategy, what are the goals that need to be accomplished, and what are the interdependencies or the commonality among the team members. If you're able to do that, then the team is in a place or a position where it can now go through the team task cycle that we talked about. And the work that I do with teams is to help them do this effectively so that they are making an impact and also to do it efficiently so that they can go from one around the dial here to five in a process that really leverages their talents and minimizes um, the amount of rework that they have to do or the amount of um, unnecessary spend of energy that they have to do to accomplish that. One tool, a very simple tool that I have used to help with that process um, is the DISC temperament inventory. So in other words, using assessments to help leaders and leadership teams work more effectively as they go through the team task cycle. At a high level, uh, we generally find that people fall into two or or three of these categories, but we often find that someone has a, a preference or a dominance of one over the other. So a lot of times people will have this driver uh, temperament where they tend to be very results oriented, bottom line, a need to run the show. Uh, the influencer temperament, which is more focused on image and recognition and the need to be able to express themselves. Uh, the stabilizer, which really is around people and process and the need for routine and harmony. And then finally, uh, in terms of providing details and a sense of quality, we often find the conscientious type of temperament, uh, those folks tend to be a little bit more private, a little bit more reserved. And again, uh, some folks will end up having more than one. I, I have worked with individuals who are both drivers and influencers, or drivers and conscientious, uh, so there's different combinations that they can have. 
So what would that look like if we were to take our leadership team? Whether it's spoken or not, they all have certain needs. So if we look at Reggie in the upper left-hand corner, his biggest concern right now is that the project is way behind schedule. And for him, what he needs is for everyone to get on, on board, get the work done more quickly so that they can meet their deadlines. Lower left-hand corner, Tanya, she has reservations. Right? She doesn't really feel the need to move forward at this point until she has some more data to collect. And so there's the potential right there that what Reggie needs and what Tanya needs are going to conflict with one another. Poor Rose in the middle, down toward the bottom, although she's not expressing it because of her temperament, um, is really just basically frustrated or concerned that there's all this change. And so she doesn't really see the need for the change quite yet. And as a final example, if you look at Vivian, really expressive idea here. She wants to be able to think creatively, to come up with innovative ideas, um, and have a chance to express those. So if we're putting this team through the team task cycle, you can now see that they're at different points along the process. Rose is still stuck at recognition, trying to make sense of the fact that there is change. Sandra, at understanding where she realizes it needs to be done, but she feels a need for more data collection or more um, better understanding. Peter, not so sure that we have the right people involved, so he's not ready to make a decision. Trey doesn't really need any more data or need to understand anything more about it. He's just simply ready to go, ready to get, that, get started. And as far as Reggie's concerned, this should have been done yesterday. So he has a much stronger sense of urgency of, of getting the timeline completed. So a lot of the work that I do is helping teams have a self-awareness on a couple levels. Uh, one is that they as a team will go through these predictable steps of recognition, understanding, decision, implementation, and completion. And more importantly, helping them understand from like a self-awareness perspective that their style and what they need may or may not be in cooperation with the style and needs of other people. So we spend time really trying to help them understand themselves so that they can begin to flex their style in support of their teammates. Now along the task cycle then, from steps one to two, two to three, and so forth, uh, I call these hurdles, roadblocks, uh, dips in the road. Uh, you can use different terms, but what it comes down to are stumbling blocks where teams get tripped up. And a lot of times they don't know that they have been tripped up, or if they do know, they really don't know how they can um, un untrip themselves and get moving again. So we call them transition barriers because they prevent movement to the next step in the team task cycle. So for uh, recognition to understanding, we call that having insight. Um, if you don't have the right insights, it's really hard to advance from recognition that there is an issue or a challenge to really deeply understanding what that is. So folks who, who tend to want to go really quickly by that step don't really have the background information that is going to help them make a decision. Sometimes teams get caught between two and three where they have understanding, they have all the data, they've done all the research, uh, but yet they're not ready to make a decision or they're afraid of making a decision that it might be the wrong one. From three to four, we mentioned this earlier, which is this difference between commitment and consensus, uh, but basically it's the work of a team leader to make sure that everyone on the team, even if they don't all agree, at least are committed to the team's success in moving forward. The barrier transition for four to five, going from implementation to completion, is really about Implementate, making sure your implementation is a success. So it's how do we integrate all the work, all the people, all the decisions that we made so that it becomes a fully implementable solution. And then finally, the last transition barrier between five and the beginning of the cycle again is really a leadership and the team willingness to withdraw or to take their hands off the steering wheel and entrust those that they have given the empowerment to 
to make the change to lead the um, organization in that particular direction. So in summary, for the second question here, how do you accelerate the startup of the team? From my experience, I've been able to use the team task cycle to help teams understand how to move through it effectively and how to move through it efficiently. Three ways of doing that. One, increasing individual self-awareness, whether you use DISC or some other instrument. The second, using that information then to increase the other awareness or what makes your uh, ability to interact with your teammates more effective. And then finally, what pulls all that together then is really looking at diversity and inclusion as a coin and how do we create the most inclusive environment by integrating the differences that are on the team. Common goals we talked about in terms of interdependence, developing the roles on the team, helping not only a, a team member understand their role, but helping other members on the team have, a, have an understanding of that as well. And then finally, some core processes get established in terms of how the team makes decisions, how does the team work through conflict, how does the team work in a matrix environment. <music>